Thank you for introducing me. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and present this project for you. Uh, I'm glad to be in Lille again. So I was here back, uh, last year, and uh, it feels like home coming here again. So yeah, let's start. I'm going to share with you a project, Magicastro, and uh, how we worked with affordances and met mental models uh, to develop the UX process interactions in the game. So this is the Black River Studios team in the beginning of the year. Uh, it's a team composed of around 40 collaborators and uh, in, in areas like game design, art, QA, production, management. We have published around 13, ti 13 titles uh, from mobile and PC. And we are currently developing three games. Uh, in the Magicaster project, we had almost half of the team work in different times. And uh, this, to the right side, is the, our portfolio in VR projects. Last year, we presented, me and my friend Kumaru, we presented the Conflict Zero Shattered and Angus. Uh, and today, I'm here to, to show you more about the Magicastra. Magicastra is a game that, it, I'm going to show a video, but it has two moments in the gameplay. The first one, you craft the musical instruments. And in the second one, you play a rhythm game. So let's see. Ah, yeah. Before we have some project premises, it was a, a demand from, from Samsung headquarters for we needed to develop a game to promote the Samsung HMD Odyssey, head mounted display Odyssey, that is this. And um, for Windows Mixed Reality, it was supposed it was expected to be a showcase experience so people can can watch it in, in conferences and uh, events and everything, and shops, and uh, it was meant for entry-level VR users. So, especially no, people that had no contact with VR. So, this is part of the gameplay. It was, yes. Go. I tested it before, yeah. It's, Yeah, now it's a newer. Google people, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. In the press F5. I love that it's always working when you try it, and then when you're on stage, never. Hmm. It's like a conspiracy from... Let's see. No? No. I tested it before. <laughs> I yeah. know. I know you did. Okay, so... I would be back to the videos again. Uh, it was ex essentially explaining, um, showing the, the video gameplay uh, with sound, because that is important. That was the reason I couldn't present a GIF, because sound is important for this game. But I will show ahead and let's act the better. So uh, these were the main references for the work. Uh, there is the VR manifest from Augur, from Mike Augur, that has a lot of guidelines for UI and interactions. Uh, Celia's work, it, it's a, always a reference in my job, because it's so consistent and uh, offers a, a lot of opportunities to explore interactions and UX design. And uh, we based our work on the Microsoft Mixed Reality documentation. So this is my presentation, four parts. Uh, I'm going to start with the overseas South Korean client, then contextual learning, affordances, and uh, the showcase experience. So dealing with a client that is in the other side of the planet. Uh, we had the challenge of time zones. We had a difference of 13 hours in communication. Uh, it impacts a lot in response time. And uh, scheduling meetings is problematic because if you check the channel, if, oh, can we meet? Can, when are you available and everything? The message may take 13 hours before you get a reply. And then you get the reply later yet. So it, it impacts on communication a lot. Uh, and it's a very long and expensive travel from Brazil to, to Suwon, where Suwon is uh, the Samsung digital city. It's a, a whole city by Samsung and technology. So 
it, the tickets are very expensive and uh, you take more than 20 hours in travel time. So it's not easy to, to meet people. Uh, we had the uh, cultural challenges. Uh, Brazil has very work-oriented head, very work-oriented uh, workloads, uh, work and uh, we had a lot of protection about working hours, overtime, and charges if the, the, the company is messing around with... Uh, but that was before the coup and the uh, Bolsonarism, so nowadays it's in a worse position. Um, so, and the, there is the hierarchy. It was very top-down since the, the demand came from the Samsung H, uh, HQ. Uh, there was a pipeline for decisions and approval that as a UX designer, I was kind of tied with my hands because uh, it was in a higher hierarchy. And uh, it kind of clouds your holistic comprehension for, for decisions. So it's, it's bad. And uh, we had the communication challenges. English was not the language, the native language for each side, so we, you had both ends as non-native non English speakers. Uh, in the conference calls, there was an unstable quality because in one end, it was kind of rush hour or peak, peak hours for, con for users, so we had like robot voices and lag and everything that makes the communication bad. Uh, so the reduced amount of retaining information there is a reduced amount because uh, if someone speaks to you, there is a problem. You nicely ask to re to repeat. There is a problem again. Every time the person answers, it's a shorter answer, so you you lose a lot of what the, the person was trying to say originally. And uh, yeah, emails were very slow, and uh, word selection and translation for the the content of the emails was a little bit problematic. Uh, so we developed our protocol for communication, so uh, three components. We have golden times, like uh, early in the morning, like 8 a.m. or 7 p.m., because these are nice times for both sides. The problem is that 8 a.m., some people are still asleep or very fresh, but 7 p.m., people are tired. One, one end was very tired already, so, but it, it's the best time. Uh, we had the 40 hours agreement that if we got no reply for approvals, uh, in 48 hours, the team decides. So it's an uh, agreement that we have with our clients nowadays. And uh, we demand at least one visit because it's a human contact. It's different when people are there. So it's something that's pref preferably in the pre-production phase. Uh, the cultural aspects, uh, we always preserve the team health. So. We also ask for horizontality and uh, communication, so you have access to, to all stakeholders and everyone in the, the, the line. And uh, making meaningful decisions for the project uh, keeps the team motivated. So uh, you, you are allowed to ask, you are allowed to, to investigate the, the reason you need to do something. And uh, communications, we have a plan like conference calls every two weeks, uh, all calls are recorded, so we avoid the problem with uh, lag and con connection problems. Uh, we can check it later. We have weekly reports for the projects. Uh, instant message in case of urgent contact. And uh, as documentation that we provide for, for the client, uh, it's incremental and evidential, so it's easier to update and uh, display. Next step, contextual learning. So it's based on the constructivist theory that basically is uh, it, each person understand the world by its own way. So my world is different from the world from everyone here. But uh, we, we construct this perception based on uh, the knowledge, the previous knowledge that we have, the exp experiences we have. And uh, this is a way we, we used to understand new things, new, new contexts, new environments. So I started from this point. As I said, uh, my work used a lot of base, basis from, the, from Celia's work. So this is how perception work, so you get the, the input from, from everything around you. Uh, there are some factors like attention, emotion, motivation. If you want to check this in, in a deeper level, check the Celia's book because it's great. And uh, all of this builds the, the, what's going to be in your brain. So you can access it later in a future moment that you need to learn some, something. 
So understand this was very important for the next step, building an environment. Uh, we wanted to build something that players can explore and learn by themselves. So stimuli and feedbacks orient the, the, the interactions. It's very common to notice this uh, in kindergarten, how children use new toys or new environments, how they, they react with the world, and how we can stimulate different approaches by colors, by shapes. Uh, so we use a lot of mental models. That uh, It's what the user believes about the system at hand. What, what they know previously about this system, what these interactions, this connection. And uh, there is also this uh, UX law, uh, Jacob's law, that basically is uh, if you are going to use something similar to, to a context that you used before, you expect it to behave like it. So you use your, your previous knowledge. Then this is the, the place where Magicastra happens. It's a pulpit. This is a, this is a pulpit in case. No, uh, this is a real pulpit comparison. So it's hard to see in the image, but basically it is composed like that. You have a, in the middle the player, where the player stands, and uh, you have a table that allows the interaction with game elements. So we wanted to work it as a workstation because it's a, in VR, you make, made it an analog to the real world. You map the area around you, so uh, you interact in the same level of, of height and everything. So it's a workstation in the end. So um, we made a, this graphic is from the, the work of Mike Auger. So there is a main contact zone that's in front of the user with this, this angle and, and depth. And uh, there are the peripheral areas. As you see here, we are using both. Both of them, the peripheral and the uh, main area, and uh, we use this ergonomics analysis to define angles for the torso rotation, the wingspan to which people would interact with the elements, the range and depths and heights for every interaction in the game. So it's based on the real world ergonomics, and uh, also we use a lot of scenographic concepts for composition, depth, lightning, lighting, and visual hierarchy. Uh, Scenography is very important to VR because you're building worlds. So this is the height relation between the player and the pulpit. Uh, the arm right here, you stand it like 45 degrees with the, the, the pulpit, so sorry. we use this as reference. But uh, as you can see, uh, if a person is smaller or, or higher than that, it would be a problem, but the Windows Mixed Reality takes into consideration what the user maps before so this relation between the pope and the player will keep if the person mapped it lower or higher. Uh, this is the, the angles that we used in the game based on uh, Mike Auger's work. work. And uh, 45 degrees in, uh, in front and uh, from height, uh, side, sorry, and from height view, the angle you turn your head, uh, 10 degrees up and uh, un up to, I think, 60 degrees down. So, uh, we built the, the environment around the player, but this is the environment in the game. As you can see, it's bright, it, it has a lot of lights, and uh, different elements, it's almost alien to, to some people. And uh, one problem that happened before that, after that was, we had a lot of stimuli. So, we need to reduce the, the stimuli to focus on the relevant interaction. People were getting a lot distracted because there was too much in the world. So we lo uh, lowered the cognitive load to, uh, for the player so they can focus on the, the relevant interaction uh, to the point that we even turned everything dark around the player so the person could just interact with the essential elements. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had a, a I was, person that was very worried because artists were very excited about the project. Everything needed to be beautiful, the lights and animations and everything. And uh, in my head, all the time it was like, okay, flashing lights would in this photosensitive epilepsy scissors. So I need to all the time talk to them. Guys, hold on, just a little, let, let's, let's reduce lights and flash and everything. I know it's beautiful, but we need to work because we don't want people having scissors when they are playing our game. Um, about text and localization, it was a design decision to, to reduce the 
the, to the least tax that we'll, we would have in the game because uh, in the real world we have tax and labels to help, but uh, interaction, like the babies interact, they don't know how to read, so they need to understand the context and, context and everything. So uh, as a showcase experience, it was decided to have the list tax. Uh, our spreadsheet was composed just by few short instructions and status message. These are right from the, the spreadsheet. And uh, later we had to add uh, the end user agreement and the privacy policy that is a huge amount of text. I do not recommend anyone to put that amount of text in VR because it sucks. You need to scroll and yeah, find another way. We had to and it's, it's terrible. And we used the Microsoft Mixed Reality Guidelines for the Y, so all text panels were in a reading distance of two meters uh, with high, high cont contracts. This was how it was presented in, in the game, a dark shade before, behind the, the white text with high contracts and perpendicular toward the anchored position. So if the player is standing here, every, every text is towards the person. So uh, about affordances, uh, it's a property that Basically, it's, 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 if something looks like glass, you expect it to behave like glass. If something looks like wood, we, you expect it to, to behave like wood. So, in that sense, we start designing the gameplay elements. And uh, it was uh, work made with the, the art team, very close with the art team, because they needed to understand some concepts about affordances and uh, interactions that would help with designing the, the, the interactions. So uh, we have the instruments that they are like, I'm going to show a picture later, but uh, there seems like sprouts and needs life. So you add life to them using the rhythms. You mix both. So rhythms were this, this is fear because it's inviting to, to, to touch. It's easy. It's a, a shape that you're used to as a, a ball as a kid. And uh, around this, this ball, we had the, a waveform that was according to the, the rhythm that is going to be played. So we had three rhythms. One was very spiky, the other one had very smooth curves, and uh, visually we can distinct them from each other. And uh, the level selector, we, we designed the concept of saplings. So you had the rounded shape in the bottom part and the leaves in the, the corals in the top part. And uh, it's inviting to, to touch too. And the players needed to put it in a place to the left side that uh, would flourish the entire level. That was the reason we, we, the justification we used to make everything darker on the player in the first moment because we need to lower the, the cognitive load. So as soon as the level is started, then you present everything because the player already learned what needed, was needed to be learned there. And uh, for the rhythm gameplay, we just use a simple concept of bubbles because, yeah, everyone played with bubbles when I was a kid, so we, we wanted to, to bring that back. And it just popped by touching them. Uh, so why, when we were designing the, the interactions, we used some uh, UX laws that uh, basically uh, we cannot, for Tesla's law, we cannot reduce uh, a minimum amount of, of complex that system has. So even though I wanted to make it as simple as possible, that was my threshold about using the controllers for the, for the Odyssey and everything. Uh, proximity, we, we had a lot of it. So uh, you identify items that are near to each other. Uh, if they are, you ident identify them as, as a group, if they are near. Uh, we use the law of pronouns, sorry for the pronunciation, but uh, you note things as the simplest form, then, then you can perceive them. So uh, the, micro, the mic is a cube for us. Uh, we see balls and squares and triangles everywhere. And uh, the uniform connectedness, so if two elements are visually connected, they are perceived as one element. Then the others that are not connected. So uh, the first interaction is the grab and hold. We used rounded shapes or shapes that invited the user to touch. And um, we used different colors and, and features, like for the saplings. Uh, they had elastic behavior, so if a person interacts with an item, releases it, it would fall to the, to, it would return to the original position, so it, it allows error. So people would feel comfortable about it. And um, if you take the, the item close to your ear, 
the music is higher, it's, it's louder, so you can understand better what you're going to use as reference in that level. Uh, and it, it has all the, the components of a good feedback. So it had a, it changed color when you touch it, when you are in contact with it. Uh, the sound is louder if you're closer here or if you take it to your ear. And uh, there is the haptic feedback when you, you get in touch with it. Please, please, please run the video. Whoa! So... That's it. Uh, mixing the, the, the elements, uh, we organized them in two rows. Now you can see the, the rhythm, mus the musical rhythms as the waveforms, the different waveforms. And then the top row, there are the, the plants that are the, the instruments. So we organized them in two rows, especially, especially, and uh, grouped them by th similar features. So it's easier to understand what's, going, what's next to, to you. To its own, and uh, it had a magnetic behavior for the mixing. So it, there is a visual link. Uh, if they are closed, they are going to become an, something else. And if you unlink them, uh, a fair, it's, you can sell cancels the the mix. And uh, they, if you throw them away, because people like to throw things in VR, that's classic. So every time you throw th something away, it, it spawns right at the, the position later. Uh, it's different from the level selectors because levels were the first interaction, so we we wouldn't allow players to, to just throw thing, things away in that context, but here it was okay. Yeah. Uh, so about placing the, the instruments in the pulpit, uh, it, these interactions were planned to be inside the peripheral zone, so if I mix things to my right, uh, in the peripheral area there, there is going to be a feedback, visual feedback and sound that uh, I, I turn myself to that side as a stimuli. So uh, as soon as someone picks an, an item, uh, there are visual feedbacks active and at that moment. If I release the item, the visual feedback is gone, so I connect them visually that uh, uh, I need, uh, I can do something else with the item in my hand. So, we used also a concept of ghost shape in the crystal, so, crystal is how you start a level, so you can grab it and you see the ghost shape and people usually check, oh, it's the same shape. What happens if I position them at the same same place? So the level start and uh, you can play the rhythm game. Um, so about the rhythm game, it was a uh, uh, we had a problem because people were playing the pulpit, but the rhythm game started back in the in the stage. So we had a lot of problems for the first interactions in the rhythm game because people would miss them. They were amazed looking looking around and then oh I need to do something else. So you're going to see in the video. Uh, it's all based on Collider, so people can do, just touch the, the bubbles. And uh, we had two types of, of interactions, the movement and the heat. Uh, movement, they have a, a, a vector, so you, you need to move according to it. And the heat was the, just touching the colliders. And uh, they were distributed in, in, a, in a grid, so you have six horizontal positions and three verticals, so you have both groups of can reach both groups with your hand. And um, important, the success and failure feedbacks. Bubbles would pop red if it was in a wrong time, and uh, you had different visual effects for the correct interactions. So you can see the stimuli taking to the end of, to the back of the stage, then everything, you have the lanes to, to the side moving to you, and then the game starts. Yes, yeah, that, that was it. Uh, so uh, we had a lot of uh, tests and uh, prototypes for the interactions. We, we, we dropped a lot of different interactions because they were too hard for, for the entry-level users. 
we had connect points and uh, we had to paint words and everything, but it was hard, so we just skipped them. And uh, these decisions were happening while we were playtesting the game a lot. We had uh, two major validation playtests. Uh, after the first one, the game changed, changed drastically, so were both moment both moments were very important for 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 the game and for decisions and uh all the time we had regular smaller play tests uh because if you were working with entry level user and uh every opportunity that you have to to use to to find someone and talk to and ask them to play test it's golden because as soon as the person tried v r for the first time it's burnt you can you cannot test with that person again. So I pretty much tested with everyone in the office, everyone, all my colleagues that had no VR experience, and people outsourced from, from, from security, from cleaning, from visits, everyone, everyone. I was the, the, the guy that, hey, have you ever tried VR? <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we made a lot of play tests. And uh, in the end, uh, the game, People are so excited. It's a short game. It's a short experience. But uh, people would, uh, the average session time was 24 minutes around. So it was great. It, it, good see. People would stop playing the game because they were tired because it's a, it's a rhythm game in the end. So they, they become tired and, uh, and everything. Uh, and during the playtest, the positive aspects of the game were creating this music, the magical environment, and uh, feeling like my, it's a magic caster because we, you're supposed to act like a master, the pooped and everything. So they felt that in the game. And uh, the minor point that we needed to fix was uh, we had, people were asking for a score system. But our game designers didn't want to put a score system because it's not, uh, it's not about it. It's about the experience. So, but people feel, people have some needs, but it's strange because they, they, they identify it as a, a need, but it wasn't really needed. It was about how you feel about it. So, yeah, it was a, a design decision. Uh, the bubbles, they, the, the limit zone where people would pop them, uh, it was hard to understand because uh, game designers were adjusting them a lot to feel com comfortable. But in the end, we used the, the pulpit as the best position because in VR, people avoid entering objects. It's weird, it's strange. So people, if you see something, you don't enter. But you, you can. So we use the pulpit as the limit zone. And uh, the error feedbacks were not very clear. We had a lot of problems with that. But uh, it was a, a minor, because we didn't have a score system. It was more about, OK, uh, how do you feel when you're playing and not missing everything? OK, the last part uh, is the showcase experience. What we, it's a, a exciting occasion or medium. Uh, for, for exhibiting something to someone uh, in a way that it's favorable for a product. So why, why it matters? Uh, watching someone play is engaging. So yeah, curiosity is an instinct. So you can, if people see someone acting different, they want to know what's happening, if it's uh, uh, something dangerous or if it's, uh, it's a pleasure. So they, they, you, you instigate the curiosity. Uh, and they need to understand it. and. Uh, they want a shared experience. So what are you doing? I want to do it too. Is it, if it's cool, I want to do it too. And uh, we need to promote the hardware. So that was the reason. Uh, then we need to pay attention to our players' body language. We expected the hand movements rhythmically, flowing movements, and uh, interaction with both hands. But in reality, people were like little T-Rex. It's a T-Rex position that we call it. It's with arms closed. and. Uh, Close to the body, short and shy movements, and uh, hitting the bubble with only one hand. Uh, we made adjustments uh, to the interaction vector and speed to, to match what we expected as interaction when you were popping up. This, this kid was very excited playing the game. And uh, I have another video, but yeah, he was very happy in doing that. Uh, we adjust the height and distance for the bubble interaction. So uh, yeah, like I said, the puppet was a visual position for visual cue for body position. And um, that, that adju uh, adjusted height and distance, uh, they helped when people needed to make flowing movements. And um, using both hands in the gameplay was a client request, but 
from the beginning, we, we were paying attention to, okay, if someone can't use both hands, is it still playable? So we kind of uh, made what the client requested, but there is a, a threshold that allows you to play with one hand. It's hard. Uh, sorry, it's hard. But uh, it was the, the, the middle path between doesn't allowing it or having only one hand. So it's challenging, but it's playable. And there are some lessons that we can take from uh, Showcase experience that watching someone playing VR generates this curiosity and uh, work out a call to action. So it's something nice to, 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 to have. Uh, it's hard to share because VR does not really translate so well to displays. Uh, so inside the game, it feels like you're amazing, everything is amazing. But outside the game, it's like that. So it, it does not translate. If you want to watch someone and when you watch in a display, uh, you have a completely different sense of field of view and scale. It's different. Uh, you would say, isn't the person seeing that object that is in the display? No, it's not, because it's up here. You can see, but the person can't see in VR, so it's different. Um, so I think, I don't know if I'm on time, I think so, but... Yeah, wealth text. So these are the points that I want to, to highlight for you. Uh, having a, an overseas client, you need a uh, communication plan, uh, agreements, and schedule. Uh, visits are necessary. Add them to your budget, because it's a human component. You need to see people and talk to people face-to-face. Uh, in, in -face. It's really important. Uh, about the contextual learning, uh, exploring a new world means that people are going to, to check and test and play with it. So you have to provide a safe zone for that. So you allow errors and uh, it's, it's good for them. Uh, about the mental models, uh, you have to understand how people are going to understand your interactions so you can make them as simple as possible. So mapping this, this the way they understand the world uh, is a good, a good path. And uh, showcase experience, uh, like I said, it's hard to share, it's very personal. Uh, watching is engaging. But, and, and you can tailor it as a call to action of onboarding. Uh, and sure, it needs more studies uh, as a general, as a area, knowledge area. So we can find improvements in how VR is in the market today. And um, affordances, uh, your players will interact with the world the way they understand it. So invite them to use shapes, colors, sound, materials, patterns, behaviors, and feedbacks because uh, that's how they are going to relate to it. And uh, there is a bonus here. Uh, during the project, uh, I was the annoying person saying everything about accessibility with the team, and most of them were not aware, and they, we started discussing about it. And uh, after some time, it was good to see that people were caring about it. They were bringing bring information. Oh, oh uh, what do you think about using these colors? What do you think about using these shapes? And I was, OK, that is nice, because now I know that they, they had the little seed of accessibility within them, and it's going to flourish, even if I'm not here. So that was really nice to, to, to see. And uh, each one of you has this power in your team. So yeah, you are an advocate of accessibility. You cannot avoid that. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much.